We're continuing our studies in Chapter 19 on the regulation of mammalian fuel metabolism, and in this lesson we'll be looking at the effects of insulin. First of all, not all cells have insulin receptors, so the response is tissue-specific. Remember, if the hormone is not produced, there can be no effect, but also if there is no receptor to which the hormone can bind, likewise there can be no effect on that cell. The first effect of insulin binding is the uptake of glucose. This is so that we can lower the glucose level in the bloodstream. The GLUT4 is a type of glucose transporter that's localized to membranes of intracellular vesicles, and that's illustrated in the figure at the top of our screen here. The GLUT4 receptors are in blue, and they're localized to these vesicles, so they're not on the surface of the cell normally. The binding of insulin to the receptor stimulates the translocation of these GLUT4 transporters in muscle and adipose tissue so that they're put on the surface of the cell. This is another example of the fusion of vesicles with plasma membranes. So there we thereby put these GLUT4 receptors on the surface. In essence, we're opening the cellular doors to let glucose in. We're putting more doors on the surface of our cell, and these doors work a little bit better, so we'll rapidly uptake glucose for processing and rapidly lower the level of blood glucose. Just as a side note, regular exercise also increases the number of GLUT4 transporters, and so that also helps us to regulate our blood sugar levels. What is the effect after the glucose is taken up by the cell? What are the further effects of insulin? Well, remember, insulin signals fuel abundance. In the first case, we'll look at glucose. If we have an abundance of glucose, then we want to stimulate using glucose and storing it, and we want to inhibit mobilization of stored glucose in the form of glycogen. So we want to stimulate glycogen storage, and therefore we're going to activate the enzyme that catalyzes glycogen storage, glycogen synthase. At the same time, we want to inhibit glycogen breakdown, and therefore we want to inhibit the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. The interesting thing is we'll accomplish both purposes in one step. We'll use a phosphatase that will dephosphorylate these enzymes. It will activate one and inactivate the other, and that's part of our illustration here. A phosphatase will remove a phosphoryl group from glycogen synthase and convert it from its less active B form to its more active A form, A for active. This same enzyme will also remove a phosphoryl group from glycogen phosphorylase and thereby convert it to the less active form. So the same signal and the same enzyme will dephosphorylate and activate glycogen synthase and inactivate glycogen phosphorylase. So in the same response, we have encouraged glycogen synthesis and discouraged glycogen breakdown. The global effect of insulin is to burn fuel and store any excess for later use. Some of the glucose is used by the liver to synthesize fatty acids and triacylglycerols, and this can be sent to tissues as VLDL and LDL, as illustrated here. Insulin also stimulates lipases to release fatty acids from lipoproteins so that they can be taken up by adipocytes and stored as triacylglycerols, as illustrated here. Remember, if insulin metabolism is disrupted in any way, we not only affect glucose metabolism, we also affect fatty acid metabolism. In our next video lesson, we want to see where glucagon is produced and what are its effects on glucose metabolism, as well as the effects of the hormone epinephrine. In addition, we want to see what are the benefits of signaling cascades in general in terms of fuel metabolism.